schools have to adapt, and they are. It's just not as fast as we'd all like it to be. Marysville schools have an advantage that other schools may not be so lucky to have. Starting at the beginning of the 2015 to 2016 school year, we adapted our schools to a one-to-one -one computer to student plan, meaning that for every one student, there's one computer. Layman's terms, every student has a Google Chromebook issued by the school district. This may not seem large to someone, but to put it into perspective, in 1984, for every one computer, there was 92 students. Now, of course, this number has gone down largely. According to a statistic in 2008, it was down to one computer for every eight students. But in the Marysville School District, it's one to one. The, the problem we're having, and this becomes the biggest issue we're having, and like I said, I travel the world, and it, it's a global thing we're having, is we're trying to figure out the biggest thing we're wrestling with, and especially in education, is what skills do we give up? When we look back into our history of education, something has always been given up. In return, we learned something new. The change from cool to pencil and paper was a drastic change to children and adult lives. Were there people who disagreed with the change? And people don't remember this because we weren't around. Right. We're talking generations ago. There was a, because the idea was is that kids will not know how to actually write with quill and ink. That we're going to lose that skill. Right? And kids wouldn't know how to refill their ink or take care of their ink pen. These were things that we, we did not want to move to paper and pencil. And now we moved to paper and pencil, right? Once we went one-to-one -one with paper and pencil, that change transformed the way education right. happened. And now with technology is the next disruption. Using a card catalog in a library, I know there were people worried about that, that we wouldn't know how to use that, but really why do I still need to use that? Um, I need to find a variety of sources and judge whether they're valid or not um, and be able to search creatively, but I probably don't need to even learn how to use those cards. Um, penmanship and cursive is the big thing right now. Right. Uh, There's a real big debate in education right now about whether or not we should be giving up teaching kids cursive. And it kind of connects to that. And going through school, I had to learn how to write in cursive. I don't think that really contributes to what I can and cannot do as a human being. I think that, you know, the iPads and things we're using now in 100 years are going to look totally obsolete. And more, probably more like five years, the way to, things continue to change and change and change. And I think the important thing is to look at things and say, okay, what is it about having physical things. Well, this whole tactile sense is pretty awesome for some people, and I know that some of my students really connect to that. So how can we, in the future, make sure that kids can use that sense of touch with things that are changing in the future? And as long as they can somehow, in some ways, I don't think whether or not they're writing with pencils on paper really matters so much. And I'm kind of caught in that. I mean, I, I, it's, it's sad if we lose cursive. Yeah. Um, and yet I think it's sadder if we have kids practicing cursive and not learning how to navigate this world of information that's just ever expanding. So. With the situation of technology that we're dealing with now, it's basically history repeating itself. Once there's a new piece of tech, the disruption ensues. But there are other issues with the ever-changing technology in schools. Some parents aren't enthusiastic when it comes to technology. A part of it is, is it's just a big system. Um, and it's a system that is that uh, is steeped in tradition and loves its traditions. It's also a system that's probably the hardest to change because every American went through this system. So we know what school looks like. We know what school smells like. And we remember our best teacher. 
I think there's always pushback when people are afraid of things and technology is new and having access to these things are new. And I had the most pushback and the most fear from people who didn't know how to use technology themselves. Be that. So now your mom and dad are, you know, are coming here and saying, well, I don't want, why, that's not how school looked for me and it worked for me. Yeah. And if I made it through, then make it look the same for my kid. And so particularly, it's odd that the, the parents we're getting the most pushback from tend to be the parents who were successful in a traditional school model. The parents we get less pushback from are the parents who struggled in school themselves because they're already seeing school as um, challenging in a different way. And I think the way you address that is information. So the, the data points that we can collect and show, yeah, look, look at how you use a, a computer. So we did some community outreach. We uh, have iPad help clubs after school once a week so parents can come in and get some help too. We do a technology help class for sixth grade parents at the beginning of each school year to try to talk them through some of our major things. Um, we have some students that are currently putting together help videos for that they're posting on YouTube to help our families with some of the technology struggles. But I think that's true with anything when things change people have fear and pushback and it's definitely less now than it used to be and we've noticed a huge shift in the comfort of parents just over the last couple of years and so we're having this generational thing that all of a sudden if school looked different parents freak out because we know what school is yeah. school has looked the same since the early 1900s and all of a sudden you want to radically change the way school looks and feels and maybe you don't have to go to school every day maybe you only have to school to go three days a week because you can do two days online and we just don't know what that looks like and so it, it's not just changing education it's changing the culture of america so whether parents like it or not schools are changing inside of the marysville school district there lies a middle school called 10th street they believe that the fine arts contribute to the success of their students therefore they feature music and art as two elective courses they are an iPad learning community, so they use devices to support all of their lessons. So what were the first thoughts about iPads? A couple of different changes we noticed right away. Some kids that were not engaged in the past quickly became much more engaged in what we were doing. Just being able to use the technology, kids that were like to use their free time to, to play video games or were interested in browsing the web, some of that changed right away. I think we saw more changes the more we grew in our skills and how to use them and incorporate them into the classroom. Um, and there were some challenges too, it wasn't all easy. Kids learning how to self-regulate and not uh, to be doing the right thing at the right time with the iPads and not be distracted by some of the things that are inherent distractions with having technology easily accessible. And our use of knowing how to monitor kids and help support them changed too. In a classroom full of students with technology, how are we able to keep them on task? We'll just say flip and listen, and they'll flip their iPads upside down, And we'll, but we have to really teach them the skill of actively turning off the technology to pay attention sometimes. And then I think too, just normal things like walking around the classroom, making sure that I'm looking over their shoulder, seeing what they're engaged in helps too. It's easy to be distracted and it's not a big deal, but I think learning how to use the technology in engaging ways so they get to use it in an appropriate way is the most effective. How can you use this iPad to do research or to do other activities that we're using? Then they get to use it and it's not, it's not a struggle. So the students have become comfortable with the technology. But how do we make sure teachers are just as comfortable? Open College has released a statistic saying that 91% of teachers have computers in their classroom, however, just 1 in 5 feel that their classroom is just at the right level of technology. How will we know when we have a good amount of technology in our classroom and they know how to use it? Well, and I think that stat has some truth to it, but also has some um, background to it. So, um, especially our teachers here in Marysville may have had a computer in their, in their room, um, but it may have taken 20 minutes to log on and to authenticate. Um, they may have one and they have a class of 30. Um, just, and the speed of the internet, the use of it, um, really discourages teachers uh, from being creative and trying something new. 
No teaching program taught teachers how to teach when you have a computer or when kids have a computer. And it's even still today, like I've worked with almost every university system at some point or another here in the state of Washington. We're not teaching teachers how to use it with kids or for instruction or what it does. And so there is a gap right now between teachers having access and understanding how to use. And changing beliefs and attitudes around learning is a bigger issue for us right now than putting a Chromebook in the hand of a student. Yeah. That part's easy. I mean, we did that in four weeks. Changing the nature of uh, the relationship between student, teacher, and content is going to take more time. Have you ever said there's any point where we can call it good? No. You know, we're, the internet, the internet now is almost 20 years old, and its education is just now starting to take it on. And so I think we're just starting to see the beginning phases of education saying, hey, this internet thing's not a fad, and we might need to start preparing kids for a world that is truly globally connected. And what does that mean, and how it's changing work. And I think specifically here in the state of Washington, you start looking at some of the, you start looking at a lot of the things that's coming out around, you know, we've got the second largest tech hub in the United States in, in Seattle. You have now almost 20% of um, the gross domestic product of the state of Washington is tied to the tech industry. Like, if, if you are an educational system in this state specifically, and you're not preparing kids for a technology world, we're not, we're not filling the need of our own commerce in Washington State. If you haven't already noticed, the future is going to be absolutely covered with technology. So should we just stay with the same routine we've stuck with since the early 1900s? Or do we need to introduce more computer science classes? To help your opinion, the jobs in the current times are 60% computer jobs, while the other 40% are all of math and science. However, when we look at schooling, less than 2.4% of college students graduate with a degree in computer science, and the numbers have dropped since the last decade. When we look at some statistics from AP enrollment during high school, we can see that 1.1 million students are in history, while only 0.07% are in a computer science class. There will be 1 million more computing jobs than students over the next 10 years, adding up to $500 billion in salaries. In only 27 states, computer science classes can count toward math or science high school graduation requirements. These statistics mean something. They've impacted a multitude of people. A large portion of celebrity populace agrees with influencing young minds to get ahead with technology. With quotes like, in 15 years, we'll be teaching programming just like reading and writing, and wondering why we didn't do it sooner. When you think the future, I think it's very important to be able to learn the language of coding and programming. From phones to cars to medicine, technology touches every part of our lives. If you can create technology, you can change the world. Computer science belongs in every public school, right next to biology, chemistry, or algebra. Don't just play on your phone. Program it. So years and years of evolution inside of the technology world has occurred. Everyone uses it, but what attributed to our success? When you take a look at the statistical data of population trends, many people say that our success is due to systems of philosophy. Others might say it's the founding of the world's major religions. And then another group of people might argue that, no, the major developments are forged from conquests, and that the rise of civilization raised the population. Our population is also heavily affected by things like plague and advancements in such things like math or science. Some people especially think that the Renaissance and art heavily impacted us. This is an endless debate, but when you look at the actual data, you see that none of this really changed anything. There's only been one thing that had a great effect on the population, the Industrial Revolution. The steam engine and the other associated technologies of the Industrial Revolution changed the world and influenced human history so much that in the words of the historian Ian Morris, they made mockery out of all that had come before. To understand the rapid growth of technology, 
We need to first understand Moore's law. Back in 1965, Gordon Moore, co-founder of the Intel Corporation, predicted that the number of transistors that could fit on a microchip would double every two years. So essentially, every two years, computers would become twice as powerful. This is known in the tech industry as Moore's law, and for 40 years, it was pretty accurate. We went from chips with about 2,300 transistors in 1972 to chips with about 300 million transistors by 2006. But over the last 10 years, we've fallen behind the exponential growth that Moore predicted. The processors coming off assembly lines now have about a billion transistors. So technology is evolving at a massive rate, which makes you wonder, what things can we change with technology that we already have today? Times are changing, and books are on their way to being irrelevant. With the sales of digital books up 400% in the last three years, and audiobooks also making an uprising, physical books are becoming more expensive to produce, not to mention bulky and tedious. If there was one thing I remember about university, was how freaking tedious it was to acquire textbooks. Textbooks. Textbooks is college textbook prices are soaring. With some textbooks now $300 each. I'm a law student, normally I'm spending about $1,000 a semester on my law books. $230 for three books. Hey buddy, wanna buy a textbook? It'll cost you. A grueling part of college we will all know too well is the dreaded textbooks. With some teens spending as much as $1,000 a semester, you wonder, why haven't they digitized textbooks yet? Well, some have, although the big heads up at the top of the publishing charts consider digitizing a no-no. But sure, you can go purchase a physical copy of the book. It also comes with a digital version. Too bad it's an extra $40. There are alternatives. You could rent or sell textbooks to old friends or use websites like Slugbooks, which do for you. But what if we had one mega digital textbook? Using the some odd $100,000, $200,000 it costs to create a new textbook that may already be dated by the slate of its release, we could create a virtual, cheaper, alternative textbook. Back in 1990, the average American could work their way through a college education if they so choose, spending a mere $400 per semester. However, when a higher education is becoming almost mandatory to get a job higher than minimum wage, they must work a much higher load and pay a much higher price. School is becoming increasingly expensive as university earnings steadily increase. According to the NACS in 2014, the average student paid $313 each term on the course materials alone. However, with individual books costing over $300 each, students often find themselves spending much more. Higher prices of course materials and general tuition forces the vast majority of students to take out loans and go into debt before they even get a job. The Institute for College Access and Success tells us that over 75% of four-year college students graduate with a large amount of debt, while some individual states range as high as 88%. Rates rising has become a deterrent to many students, pushing them away from higher education and effectively keeping the lower class from getting better jobs. If you break it down, the median family income for Americans was just over $50,000 a year. While at the same time, the average four-year university costs nearly $10,000 a year. In a family of four, you can't always sacrifice a fifth or more of your income for someone's college education. If an $1,000 expense came up, 7 out of 10 people wouldn't be able to pay it. They'd have to take out a loan. This is what electronic textbooks could solve for us. The days of toting heavy textbooks are gone for some Indiana University students. They opted out into the school's digital learning program. Starting in 2012, the Indiana University program had saved the students about $8 million by making electronic textbooks available. Students are able to access their texts, which run about $35, via the internet from mobile devices to computers. Users can highlight, take notes, and share the electronic text. This is so much easier than having to spend $300 on a textbook. So why not create one? Think of the money it would save students. Think of the jobs it could create web designers, and history professions alike. The tools are right in front of us. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Think of all the devices and tools that would soon be able to be created with the help of technology. We're on the forefront of a new era. What does the idea of interconnectivity mean to you? Hmm.
this idea that there's eight billion people on the planet, that's a lot of people, and that we're spread out geographically, and that's probably going to change more and more as we can start building colonies on Mars and other things. But this tool can bring us together is really powerful, is really powerful. I'm sure, you know, the telephone changed things a lot. And being able to physically take letters back and forth across oceans was huge. But now in an instant, you can pull up and see and, and talk to somebody across the world. And that's huge. And get to know them through common groups and things online and meet them online in ways that we couldn't in the past is really powerful. Interconnectivity is vital. This generation lives it, breathes it, reads it, and sends it. We can't just sit here and act like it doesn't exist. We have to teach each other how to use it and how to stay ahead of the game we call life. If our education systems won't change, then we're going to have to find our way to work around it. Colleges are already starting to deal with this, um, are starting to feel the brunt, and I think K-12 will too, is that the people, people will adapt around the system. So we were already seeing that here in the state of Washington, that the Washington, the Washington State Online High School, so you could go, your entire high school could be online if you wanted it to be, is growing every year, right? People are starting to see that this system isn't fitting the need of society, and people will adapt around the system. It's the same reason why now Google offers a nano degree and basically says, if you want to be a, if you want to be a computer engineer, don't go spend $90,000 at a university. You can take these five online courses. It'll cost you roughly $1,100. And if you pass these five courses, we guarantee you an internship at Google. Why, what are you, so Google in companies, and Google's just one, AT&T is doing this, Microsoft is starting to do this. They're all starting to do this idea where you're looking at the four-year university. It's not adapting to the needs that we need as companies on the other end, so we go around the system. We have to try our hardest to update our school systems so that we can better our learning. There are so many things you could do, but if all else fails, your school board shuts you down, teachers don't agree with what you're saying, then you have to take it upon yourself to learn. There are hundreds of sites you can use, code.org being a great example. Don't wait for education to finally catch up. Push yourself and get farther and farther. But to me, death is not, and death is not a fearful thing. It's living this treachery. Background audio, right? Just because I have first.